Part two, chapter two of Mazora, a prophecy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mazora, a prophecy, by Mary E. Bradley Lane. Part two, chapter two. I trembled at the suggestion of my own thoughts was this an enchanted country where the lovely blonde women fairies or some weird beings of different species human only in form or was i dreaming i do not believe i understand you i said i never heard of a country where there were no men in my land they are so very very important possibly was the placid answer and you are really a nation of women yes she said and have been for the last three thousand years will you tell me how this wonderful change came about certainly but in order to do it i must go back to our very remote ancestry the civilization that i shall begin with must have resembled the present condition of your own country as you describe it prisons and punishments were prevalent throughout the land I inquired how long prisons and places of punishment had been abolished in Mazora. For more than two thousand years, she replied. I have no personal knowledge of crime. When I speak of it, it is wholly from an historical standpoint. A theft has not been committed in this country for many, many centuries, and those minor crimes, such as envy, jealousy, malice, and falsehood, disappeared a long time ago. You will not find a citizen in Mazora who possesses the slightest trace of any of them. Did they exist in earlier times? Yes, our oldest histories are but records of a succession of dramas in which the actors were continually striving for power and exercising all of those ancient qualities of mind to obtain it. Plots, intrigues, murders, and war were the active employments of the very ancient rulers of our land. As soon as death laid its inactivity upon one actor, another took his place. It might have continued so, and we might still be repeating the old tragedy, but for one singular event. In the history of your own people you have no doubt observed that the very thing plotted, intrigued, and labored for has in accomplishment proved the ruin of its projectors. You will remark this in the history I am about to relate. Main ages ago, this country was peopled by two races, male and female. The male race were rulers in public and domestic life. Their supremacy had come down from prehistoric time, when strength of muscle was the only master. Woman was a beast of burden. She was regarded as inferior to man, mentally as well as physically. This idea prevailed through centuries of the earlier civilization. Even after enlightenment had brought her to a chivalrous regard from men, but this regard was bestowed only upon the women of their own household by the rich and powerful those women who had not been fortunate enough to have been born in such a sphere of life toiled early and late in sorrow and privation for a mere pittance that was barely sufficient to keep the flame of life from going out their labor was more arduous than men's and their wages lighter the government consisted of an aristocracy, a fortunate few who were continually at strife with one another to gain supremacy of power or an acquisition of territory. Wars, famine, and pestilence were of frequent occurrence. Of the subjects, male and female, some had everything to render life a pleasure, while others had nothing. Poverty, oppression, and wretchedness was the lot of the many. Power, wealth, and luxury the dower of the few children came into the world undesired even by those who were able to rear them and often after an attempt had been made to prevent their coming alive consequently numbers of them were deformed not only physically but mentally under these conditions life was a misery to the larger part of the human race and to end it by self-destruction was taught by their religion to be a crime punishable with eternal torment by quenchless fire but a revolution was at hand stinted toil rose up armed and wrathful against opulent oppression the struggle was long and tragical 
and was waged with such rancor and desperate persistence by the insurrectionist that their women and children began to supply the places vacated by fallen fathers husbands and brothers it ended in victory for them they demanded a form of government that should be the property of all it was granted limiting its privileges to adult male citizens the first representative government lasted a century in that time civilization had taken an advance far excelling the progress made in three centuries previous so surely does the mind crave freedom for its perfect development the consciousness of liberty is an ennobling element in human nature no nation can become universally moral until it is absolutely free but this first republic had been diseased from its birth slavery had existed in certain districts of the nation it was really the remnants of a former and more degraded state of society which the new government in the exultation of its own triumphant inauguration neglected or lacked the wisdom to remedy a portion of the country refused to admit slavery within its territory but pledged itself not to interfere with that which had enmities however arose between the two sections which after years of repression and useless conciliation culminated in another civil war slavery had resolved to absorb more territory and the free territory had resolved that it should not the war that followed in consequence severed forever the fetters of the slave and was the primary cause of the extinction of the male race the inevitable effect of slavery enervating and demoralizing it is a canker that eats into the vitals of any nation that harbors it no matter what form it assumes the free territory had all the vigor wealth and capacity for long endurance that self-dependence gives it was in every respect prepared for a long and severe struggle its forces were collected in the name of the united government considering the marked inequality of the combatants the war would necessarily have been of short duration but political corruption had crept into the trust places of the government and unscrupulous politicians and office-seekers saw too many opportunities to harvest wealth from a continuation of the war it was to their interest to prolong it and they did they placed in the most responsible positions of the army military men whose incapacity was well known to them and sustained them there while the country wept its maimed and dying sons the slave territory brought to the front its most capable talent it would have conquered had not the resources against which it contended been almost unlimited utterly worn out every available means of supply being exhausted it collapsed from internal weakness the general government in order to satisfy the clamors of the distressed and impatient people whose sons were being sacrificed and whose taxes were increasing to prolong the war had kept removing and reinstating military commanders but always of reliable incapacity a man of mediocre intellect and boundless self-conceit happened to be the commander-in-chief of the government army when the insurrection collapsed the politicians whose nefarious scheming had prolonged the war saw their opportunity for furthering their own interest by securing his popularity they assumed him to be the greatest military genius that the world had ever produced as evidenced by his success where so many others had failed it was known that he had never risked a battle until he was assured that his own soldiers were better equipped and outnumbered the enemy but the politicians asserted that such a precaution alone should mark him as an extraordinary military genius the deluded people accepted him as a hero the politicians exhausted their ingenuity in inventing honors for him a new office of special military eminence with a large salary attached was created for him he was burdened with distinctions and emoluments always worked by the politicians the nation following the lead of the political leaders joined in their adulation it failed to perceive the dangerous path that leads to anarchy and despotism the worship of one man it had unfortunately selected one who was cautious and undemonstrative and who had become convinced that he really was the greatest prodigy that the world had ever produced he was made president and then the egotism and narrow selfishness of the man began to exhibit itself 
he assumed all the prerogatives of royalty that his position would permit he elevated his obscure and numerous relatives to responsible offices large salaries were paid them and intelligent clerks hired by the government to perform their official duties corruption spread into every department but the nation was blind to its danger the few who did perceive the weakness and presumption of the hero were silenced by popular opinion a second term of office was given him and then the real character of the man began to display itself before the people the whole nature of the man was selfish and stubborn the strongest mental trait possessed by him was cunning his long lease of power and the adulation of his political beneficiaries acting upon a superlative self-conceit imbued him with the belief that he had really rendered his country a service so inestimable that it would be impossible for it to entirely liquidate it he exalted to unsuitable public offices his most intimate friends they grew suddenly exclusive and aristocratic forming marriages with eminent families he travelled about the country with his entire family at the expense of the government to gradually prepare the people for the ostentation of royalty the cities and towns that he visited furnished feats illuminations parades and every variety of entertainment that could be thought of or invented for his amusement or glorification lest the parade might not be sufficiently gorgeous or demonstrative he secretly sent agents to prepare the program and size of his reception always at the expense of the city he intended to honor with his presence he manifested a strong desire to subvert the will of the people to his will when informed that a measure he had proposed was unconstitutional he requested that the constitution be changed his intimate friends he placed in the most important and trustworthy positions under the government and protected them with the power of his own office many things that were distasteful and unlawful in a free government were flagrantly flaunted in the face of the people and were followed by other slow but sure approaches to the usurpation of the liberties of the nation he urged the government to double his salary as president and it complied there had long existed a class of politicians who secretly desired to convert the republic into an empire that they might secure greater power and opulence they had seen in the deluded enthusiasm of the people for one man the opportunity for which they had long waited and schemed he was unscrupulous and ambitious and power had become a necessity to feed the cravings of his vanity the constitution of the country forbade the office of president to be occupied by one man for more than two terms the empire party proposed to amend it permitting the people to elect a president for any number of terms or for life if they choose they tried to persuade the people that the country owed the greatest general of all time so distinctive an honor they even claimed that it was necessary to the preservation of the government that his popularity could command an army to sustain him if he called for it but the people had begun to penetrate the designs of the hero and bitterly denounced his resolution to seek a third term of power the terrible corruptions that had been openly protected by him had advertised him as a criminal unfit for so responsible an office but alas the people had delayed too long they had taken a young elephant into the palace they had petted and fed him and admired his bulky growth and now they could not remove him without destroying the building the politicians who had managed the government so long proved that they had more power than the people they succeeded by practices that were common with politicians in those days in getting him nominated for a third term the people now thoroughly alarmed began to see their past folly and delusion they made energetic efforts to defeat his election but they were unavailing the politicians had arranged the ballot and when the counts were published the hero was declared president for life when too late the deluded people discovered that they had helped dig the grave for the corpse of their civil liberty and those who were loyal and had been misled saw it buried with unavailing regret the undeserved popularity bestowed upon a narrow and selfish nature had been its ruin in his inaugural address he declared that nothing but the will of the people governed him he had not desired the office 
public life was distasteful to him yet he was willing to sacrifice himself for the good of his country had the people been less enlightened they might have yielded without a murmur but they had enjoyed too long the privileges of a free government to see it usurped without a struggle tumult and disorder prevailed over the country soldiers were called out to protect the new government but numbers of them refused to obey the consequence was they fought among themselves a dissolution of the government was the result the general that they had lauded so greatly failed to bring order out of chaos and the schemers who had foisted him into power now turned upon him with the fury of treacherous natures when foiled of their prey innumerable factions sprung up all over the land each with the leader ambitious and hopeful of subduing the whole to his rule they fought until the extermination of the race became imminent when a new and unsuspected power arose and mastered the female portion of the nation had never had a share in the government their privileges were only what the chivalry or kindness of the men permitted in law their rights were greatly inferior the evils of anarchy fell within direct effect upon them at first they organized for mutual protection from the lawlessness that prevailed the organizations grew united and developed into military power they used their power wisely discreetly and effectively with consummate skill and energy they gathered the reins of government in their own hands their first aim had only been to force the country into peace the anarchy that reigned had demoralized society and they had suffered most they had long pleaded for an equality of citizenship with men but had pleaded in vain they now remembered it and resolved to keep the government that their wisdom and power had restored they had been hampered in educational progress colleges and all avenues to higher intellectual development had been rigorously closed against them the professional pursuits of life were denied them but a few with sublime courage and energy had forced their way into them amid the revelings of some of their own sex and opposition of the men it was these brave spirits who had earned their liberal cultivation with so much difficulty that had organized and directed the new power they generously offered to form a government that should be the property of all intelligent adult citizens not criminal but these wise women were a small minority the majority were ruled by the remembrance of past injustice they were now the power and declared their intention to hold the government for a century they formed a republic in which they remedied many of the defects that had marred the republic of men they constituted the nation an integer which could never be disintegrated by states rights ideas or the assumption of state sovereignty they proposed a code of laws for the home government of the states which every state in the union ratified as their state constitution thus making a uniformity and strength that the republic of men had never known or suspected attainable they made it a law of every state that criminals could be arrested in any state they might flee to without legal authority other than that obtained in the vicinity of the crime they made a law that criminals tried and convicted of crime could not be pardoned without the sanction of seventy-five out of one hundred educated and disinterested people who should weigh the testimony and render their decision under oath it is scarcely necessary to add that few criminals ever were pardoned it removed from the office of governor the responsibility of pardoning or rejecting pardons as a purely personal privilege it abolished the power of rich criminals to bribe their escape from justice a practice that had secretly existed in the former republic in forming their government the women who were its founders profited largely by the mistakes or wisdom displayed in the government of men neither the general government nor the state government could be independent of the other a law of the union could not become such until ratified by every state legislature a state law could not become constitutional until ratified by congress in forming the state constitutions laws were selected from the different state constitutions that had proven wise for state government during the former republic in the republic of men each state had made and ratified its own laws independent of the general government the consequence was 
no two states possessed similar laws to secure strength and avoid confusion was the aim of the founders of the new government the constitution of the national government provided for the exclusion of the male sex from all affairs and privileges for a period of one hundred years at the end of that time not a representative of the sex was in existence end of part two chapter two of mazora a prophecy Part two, chapter three of Misera, a prophecy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Stays. Misera, a prophecy by Mary E. Bradley Lane. Chapter three. I expressed my astonishment at her revelation. Their social life existed under conditions that were incredible to me. Would it be an impertinence to ask for an explanation that I might comprehend? Or was it really the one secret they possessed and guarded from discovery, a mystery that must forever surround them with a halo of doubt, the suggestion of uncanny power? I spoke as deprecatingly as I could. The preceptress turned upon me a calm but penetrating gaze. "'Have we impressed you as a mysterious people?' she asked. "'Very, very much,' I exclaimed. "'I have at times been oppressed by it.' "'You never mentioned it,' she said kindly. "'I could not find an opportunity to,' I said. "'It is the custom in Mizra, as you have no doubt observed, "'never to make domestic affairs a topic of conversation outside of the family, "'the only ones who would be interested in them.' and this refinement has kept you from the solution of our social system i have no hesitancy in gratifying your wish to comprehend it the best way to do it is to let history lead up to it if you have the patience to listen i assured her that i was anxious to hear all she chose to tell she then resumed the prosperity of the country rapidly increased under the rule of the female presidents the majority of them were in favor of a high state of morality, and they enforced it by law and practice. The arts and sciences were liberally encouraged and made rapid advancement. Colleges and schools flourished vigorously, and every branch of education was now open to women. During the Republic of Men, the government had founded and sustained a military and naval academy, where a limited number of youth of the country were educated at government expense. The female government reorganized the institutions, substituting the use of their own sex. They also founded an academy of science, which was supplied with every facility for investigation and progress. None but those having a marked predilection for scientific research could obtain admission, and then it was accorded to demonstrated ability only. This drew to the college the best female talent in the country. The number of applicants was not limited. Science had hitherto been, save by a very few, an untrodden field to women, but their encouragement and rare facilities offered soon revealed latent talent that developed rapidly. Scarcely half a century had elapsed before the pupils of the college had effected by their discoveries some remarkable changes in living, especially in the prevention and cure of diseases. However prosperous they might become, they could not dwell on political security with a portion of the citizens disfranchised the men were resolved to secure their former power intrigues and plots against the government were constantly in force among them in order to avert another civil war it was finally decided to amend the constitution and give them an equal share in the ballot they had no sooner obtained that than the old practices of the former republic were resorted to to secure their supremacy in government affairs the women looked forward to their former subjugation as only a matter of time and bitterly regretted their inability to prevent it but at the crisis a prominent scientist proposed to let the race die out science had revealed the secret of life she ceased speaking as though i fully understood her i am more bewildered than ever i exclaimed i cannot comprehend you come with me she said i followed her into the chemist's laboratory she bade me look into a microscope that she designated and tell her what i saw an exquisitely minute cell in violent motion, I answered. Daughter, she said solemnly, you are now looking upon the germ of all life. 
be it animal or vegetable a flower or human being it has that one common beginning we had advanced far enough in science to control its development know that the mother is the only important part of all life in the lowest organisms no other sex is apparent i sat down and looked at my companion in a frame of mind not easily described there was an intellectual grandeur in her look and mind that was impressive truth sat like a coronet upon her brow the revelation i had so longed for i now almost regretted it separated me so far from these beautiful companionable beings science has instructed you how to supersede nature i said finally by no means it has only taught us how to make her obey us we cannot create life we cannot develop it but we can control nature's processes of development as we will can you deprecate such a power would not your own land be happier without idiots without lunatics without deformity and disease you will give me little hope of any radical change in my own lifetime when i inform you that deformity if extraordinary becomes a source of revenue to its possessor all reforms are of slow growth she said the moral life is the highest development of nature it has evolved by the same slow processes and like the lower life its succeeding forms are always higher ones its ultimate perfection will be mind where all happiness shall dwell where pleasure shall find fruition and desire its ecstasy it is the duty of every generation to prepare the way for a higher development of the next as we see demonstrated by nature in the fossilized remains of long extinct animal life a preparatory condition for a higher form in the next evolution if you do not enjoy the fruits of your labor in your own lifetime the generation that follows you will be happier for it be not so selfish as to think only of your own narrow span of life by what means have you reached so grand a development i asked by the careful study of and adherence to nature's laws it was long years i should say centuries before the influence of the coarser nature of men was eliminated from the present race we devote the most careful attention to the mothers of our race no retarding mental or moral influences are ever permitted to reach her on the contrary the most agreeable contacts with nature all that can cheer and ennoble in art or music surround her she is an object of interest and tenderness to all who meet her guarded from unwholesome agitation furnished with nourishing and proper diet both mental and physical the child of a misera mother is always an improvement upon herself with us childhood has no sorrows we believe and the present condition of our race proves that a being environed from its birth with none but elevating influences will grow up amiable and intelligent though inheriting unfavorable tendencies on this principle we have ennobled our race and discovered the means of prolonging life and youthful loveliness far beyond the limits known by our ancestors temptation and necessity will often degrade a nature naturally inclined and desirous to be noble we early recognize this fact and that a nature once debased by crime would transmit it to prosperity for this reason we never permitted a convict to have prosperity but how have you become so beautiful i asked for in all my journeys i have not met an uncomely face or form on the contrary all of mizero's women have perfect bodies and lovely features we follow the gentle guidance of our mother nature good air and judicious exercise for generations and generations before us have helped our ancestors knew the influence of art sculpture painting and music which they were trained to appreciate but has not nature been a little generous to you i inquired no more so than she will be to any people who follow her laws when you first came here you had an idea that you could improve nature by crowding your lungs and digestive organs into a smaller space than she the maker of them intended them to occupy if you construct an engine and then cram it into a box so narrow and tight that it cannot move and then crowd on the motive power what would you expect beautiful as you think my people and they really are yet by disregarding nature's laws or trying to thwart her intentions in a few generations to come perhaps even in the next we could have coarse features and complexions stoop shoulders and deformity 
has required patience observation and care on the part of our ancestors to secure to us the priceless heritage of health and perfect bodies your people can acquire them by the same means end of chapter three part two chapter four of misora a prophecy this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mizora, A Prophecy by Mary E. Bradley Lane Chapter 4 As to physical causes, I am inclined to doubt altogether of their operation in this particular, nor do I think that men owe anything of their temper or genius to the air, food, or climate. Bacon I listened with the keenest interest to this curious and instructive history, and when the preceptress had ceased speaking, I expressed my gratitude for her kindness. There were many things about which I desired information, but particularly the method of eradicating disease and crime. These two evils were the prominent afflictions of all the civilized nations I knew. I believed that I could comprehend enough of their method of extirpation to benefit my own country. Would she kindly give it? I shall take disease first, she said, as it is a near relative of crime. You look surprised. You have known lifelong and incurable invalids who were not criminals. But go to the squalid portion of any of your large cities, where poverty and disease go hand in hand, where the child receives its life and its first nourishment from a haggard and discontented mother. Starvation is her daily dread. The little tendernesses that make home the haven of the heart are never known to her. Ill-fed, ill-clothed, ill-cherished, all that might be refined and elevated in her nature, if properly cultivated, is choked into starveling shapes by her enemy. Want. If you have any knowledge of nature, ask yourself if such a condition of birth and infancy is likely to produce a noble, healthy human being. Do your agriculturists expect a stunted, neglected tree to produce rare and luscious fruit? I was surprised at the preceptress graphic description of wretchedness, so familiar to all the civilized nations that I knew, and asked, Did such a state of society ever exist in this country? Ages ago it was as marked a social condition of this land as it is of your own today. The first great move towards eradicating the seas was in providing clean and wholesome food for the masses. It required the utmost rigor of the law to destroy the pernicious practice of adulteration. The next endeavor was to crowd poverty out of the land. In order to do this, the labor question came first under discussion, and resulted in the establishment in every state of a board of arbitration that fixed the price of labor on a percent of the profits of the business. Public and private charities were forbidden by law as having an immoral influence upon society. Charitable institutions had long been numerous and fashionable, and many persons engaged in them as much for their own benefit as that of the poor. It was not always the honest and benevolent ones who became treasurers, nor were the funds always distributed among the needy and destitute, or those whom they were collected for. The law put a stop to the possibility of such frauds, and of professional impostors seeking alms. Those who needed assistance were supplied with work, respectable, independent work furnished by the city or town in which they resided. A love of industry, its dignity and independence, was carefully instilled into every young mind. There is no country but what ought to provide for every one of its citizens a comfortable, if not luxurious, home by humane legislation on the labor question. The penitentiaries were reconstructed by the female government. One half the time formerly allotted to labor was employed in compulsory education. Industrial schools were established in every state, where all the mechanical employments were taught free. Objects of charity were sent there and compelled to become self-supporting. These industrial schools finally became state colleges, where are taught, free, all the known branches of knowledge, intellectual and mechanical. Pauperism disappeared before the wide-reaching influence of these industrial schools, but universal affluence had not come. It could not exist until education had become universal. With this object in view, the government forbade the employment of any citizen under the age of 21, and compelled their attendance at school up to that time. 
At the same time, a law was passed that authorized the furnishing of all schoolroom necessaries out of the public funds. If a higher education were desired, the state colleges furnished it free of all expenses contingent. All of these measures had a marked influence in improving the condition of society, but not all that was required. The necessity for strict sanitary laws became obvious. Cities and towns and even farms were visited, and everything that could breed malaria or produce impure air was compelled to be removed. Personal and household cleanliness at last became an object of public interest, and inspectors were appointed who visited families and reported the condition of their homes. All kinds of outdoor sports and athletic exercises were encouraged and became fashionable. All of these things combined made a great improvement in the health and vigor of our race, but still hereditary diseases lingered. There were many so enfeebled by hereditary disease they had not enough energy to seek recuperation and died, leaving offspring as wretched, who in turn followed their parents' example. Statistics were compiled and physicians' reports circulated until a law was passed prohibiting the perpetuity of deceased offspring. But although disease became less prevalent, it did not entirely disappear. The law could only reach the most deplorable afflictions and was eventually repealed. As the science of therapeutics advanced, all diseases, whether hereditary or acquired, were found to be associated with abnormal conditions of the blood. A microscopic examination of a drop of blood enabled the scientists to determine the character and intensity of any disease, and at last to effect its elimination from the system. The blood is the primal element of the body. It feeds the flesh, the nerves, the muscles, the brain. The disease cannot exist when it is in a natural condition. Countless experiments have determined the exact properties of healthy blood and how to produce it. By the use of this knowledge we have eliminated hereditary diseases and developed into a healthy and moral people. For people universally healthy is sure of being moral. Necessity begets crime. It is the wants of the ignorant and the base that suggests theft. It is a diseased fancy or a mind ignorant of the laws that govern the development of human nature that could attribute to offspring hated before birth, infancy and childhood neglected, starved, ill-used in every way, a disposition and character, amiable and humane and likely to become worthy members of society. The reverse is almost inevitable. Human nature relapses into the lower and baser instincts of its earlier existence, when neglected, ill-used and ignorant. All of those lovely traits of character which excite the enthusiast, such as gratitude, honor, Charity are the results of education only. They are not the natural instincts of the human mind, but the cultivated ones. The most rigid laws were passed in regard to the practice of medicine. No physician could become a practitioner until examined and authorized to do so by the state medical college. In order to prevent favoritism, or the furnishing of diplomas to incompetent applicants, enormous penalties were incurred by any who would sign such. The profession long ago became extinct. Every mother is a family physician. That is, she obeys the laws of nature in regard to herself and her children, and they never need a doctor. Having become healthy and independent of charity, crime began to decrease naturally. The conditions that had bred and fostered petty crimes having ceased to exist, the natures that had inherited them rose above their influence in a few generations and left honorable posterity. But crime in its grossest form is an ineradicable, hereditary taint. Generation after generation may rise and disappear in a family once tainted with it, without displaying it, and then in a most unexpected manner it will spring up in some descendant, violent and unconquerable. We tried to eliminate it as we had disease, but failed. It was an inherited molecular structure of the brain. Science could not reconstruct it. The only remedy was annihilation. Criminals had no posterity. I'm surprised, I interrupted, that possessing the power to control the development of the body, you should not do so with the mind. If we could, we would produce genius that could discover the source of all life. We can control cause and effect, but we cannot create cause. We do not even know its origin. What the perfume is to the flower, the intellect is to the body, a secret that nature keeps to herself. For a thousand years our greatest minds have sought to discover its source and we are as far from it today as we were a thousand years ago. How, then, have you obtained your mental superiority? I inquired. By securing to our offspring perfect physical and mental health. Science has taught us how to evolve intellect by following demonstrated laws. I put a seed into the ground and it comes up a little green slip that eventually becomes a tree. When I planted the seed in congenial soil and watered and tended the slip, 
I assisted nature, but I did not create the seed nor supply the force that made it develop into a tree, nor can I define that force. What has produced the exquisite refinement of your people? Like everything else, it is a result of gradual development aiming at higher improvement. By following strictly the laws that govern the evolution of life, we control the formation of the body and brain. Strong mental traits become intensified by cultivation from generation to generation and finally culminate in one glorious outburst of power called genius. But there is one peculiarity about mind. It resembles that wonderful century plant, which, after decades of developing, flowers and dies. Genius is the long unfolding bloom of mind and leaves no posterity. We carefully prepare for the future development of genius. We know that our children will be neither deformed nor imbecile, but we watch the unfolding of their intellects with the interest of a new revelation. We guide them with the greatest care. I could take a child of your people with inherited weakness of body and mind. I should rear it on proper food and exercise, both mental and physical, and it would have, when matured, a marked superiority to its parents. It is not what nature has done for us, it is what we have done for her, that makes us a race of superior people. The qualities of mind that are the general feature of your people, I remarked, are so very high, higher than our estimate of genius. How was it arrived at? By the processes I have just explained. Genius is always a leader. A genius with us has a subtlety of thought and perception beyond your power of appreciation. All organized social bodies move intellectually in a mass, with their leader just ahead of them. I have visited, as a guest, a number of your families, and found their homes adorned with paintings and sculpture that would excite wondering admiration in my own land as rare works of art, but here they only the expression of family taste and culture. Is that a quality of intellect that has been evolved, or is it a natural endowment of your race? It is not an endowment, but has been arrived at by the same process of careful cultivation. Do you see in those ancient portraits a variety of striking colors? There is not a suggestion of harmony in any of them. On the contrary, they all display violent contrasts of color. The originals of them trod this land thousands of years ago. Many of the colors, we know, were unknown to them. Color is a faculty of the mind that is wholly the result of culture. In the early ages of society, it was known only in the coarsest and most brilliant hues. A conception and appreciation of delicate harmonies in color is evidence of a superior and refined mentality. If you will notice it, the illiterate of your own land have no taste for or idea of the harmony of the color. It is the same with sound. The higher we rise in culture, the more difficult we are to please in music. Our taste becomes critical. I have been revolving some things in my mind while the preceptress was speaking, and I now ventured to express them. I said, You tell me that generations will come and go before a marked change can occur in a people. What good then would it do me or mine to study and labor and investigate in or to teach my people how to improve? They cannot comprehend progress. They have not learned by contact, as I have in Mizora, how to appreciate it. I should only waste life and happiness in trying to persuade them to get out of the ruts they have traveled so long. They think there are no other roads. I should be reviled and perhaps persecuted. My doctrines would be called visionary and impracticable. I think I had better use my knowledge for my own kindred and let the rest of the world find out the best way they can. The preceptress looked at me with mild severity. I never before had seen so near an approach to rebuke in her grand eyes. What a barbarous, barbarous idea, she exclaimed. Your country will never rise above its ignorance and degradation until out of its mental agony shall be evolved a nature kindled with an ambition that burns for humanity instead of self. It will be the nucleus round which will gather the timid but anxious, and then will be lighted that fire which no waters can quench. It burns for the liberty of thought. Let human nature once feel the warmth of its beacon fires, and it will march onward, defying all obstacles, braving all perils till it be won. Human nature is ever reaching for the unattained. It is that little spark within us that has an undying life. When we can no longer use it, it flies elsewhere. End of part two, chapter four. Part two, chapter five of Mizora, a Prophecy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mizora, a Prophecy 
by Mary E. Bradley Lane. Chapter 5 I had long contemplated a trip to the extreme southern boundary of Mizora. I had often inquired about it, and had always been answered that it was defined by an impassable ocean. I had asked them to describe it to me, for the Mizora people have a happy faculty of employing tersely expressive language when necessary, but I was always met with the surprising answer that no tongue in Mizora was eloquent enough to portray the wonders that bounded Mizora on the south. So I requested the preceptress to permit Wauna to accompany me as a guide and companion, a request she readily complied with. Will you be afraid or uneasy about trusting her on so long a journey with no companion or protector but me? I asked. The preceptress smiled at my question. Why should I be afraid, when in all the length and breadth of our land there is no evil to befall her, or you either? Strangers are friends in Mizora, in one sense of the word, when they meet. You will both travel as though among time and dear associates. You will receive every attention, courtesy and kindness that will be bestowed upon near and intimate acquaintances. No, in this land, mothers do not fear to send their daughters alone and unrecommended among strangers. When speed was acquired, the people of Mizora traveled altogether by airships. But when the pleasure of landscape viewing and the delight of acceleration of easy progress is desired, they use either railroad cars or carriages. Wana and I selected an easy and commodious carriage. It was propelled by compressed air, which Wauna said could be obtained whenever we needed a new supply at any village or country seat. Throughout the length and breadth of Mizora, the roads were artificially made. Cities, towns and villages were provided with paved streets, which the public authorities kept in a condition of perfect cleanliness. The absence of all kinds of animals rendered this comparatively easy. In alluding to this once in the presence of the preceptress, she startled me by the request that I should suggest to my people the advantage to be derived from substituting machinery for animal labor. The association of animals is degrading, she asserted. And you, who still live by tilling the soil, will find a marked change economically in dispensing with your beasts of burden. Fully four-fifths that you raise on your farms is required to feed your domestic animals. If your agriculture was devoted entirely to human food, it would make it more plentiful for the poor. I did not like to tell her that I knew many wealthy people who housed and fed their domestic animals better than they did their tenants. She would have been disgusted with such a state of barbarism. Country roads in Mizora were usually covered with cement that was prepared from pulverized granite. They were very durable and very hard. Owing to the solidity, they were not as agreeable for driving as another kind of cement they manufactured. I have previously spoken of the peculiar style of wheel that was used on all kinds of light conveyances in Mizora, and rendered their progress over any road the very luxury of motion. In our journey, Wauna took me to a number of factories, where the wonderful progress they had made in science continually surprised and delighted me. The spider and the silkworm had yielded their secret to these indefatigable searches into nature's mysteries. They could spin a thread of gossamer, or of silk from their chemicals, of any width and length, and with a rapidity that was magical. Like everything else of that nature in Mizora, these discoveries had been purchased by the government, and then made known to all. They also manufactured ivory that I could not tell from the real article. I have previously spoken of their success in producing various kinds of marble and stone. A beautiful table that I saw, made out of artificial ivory, had a painting upon the top of it. A deep border, composed of delicate, convoluted shells, extended round the top of the table and formed the shores of a mimic ocean, with coral reefs and tiny islands, and tangled seaweeds and shining fishes sporting about in the pellucid water. The surface was of highly polished smoothness, and I was informed that the picture was not a painting, but was formed of colored particles of ivory that had been worked in before the drying or solidifying process had been applied. In the same way, they formed main beautiful combinations of marbles. The magnificent marble columns that supported the portico of my friend's house were all of artificial make. The delicate green leaves and creeping vines of ivy, rose and eglantine, 
with their spray-like blossoms, were colored in the manufacturing process and chiseled out of the solid marble by the skillful hand of the artist. It would be difficult for me to even enumerate all the beautiful arts and productions of arts that I saw in Mizora. Our journey was full of incidents of this kind. Every city and town that we visited was like the introduction of a new picture. There was no sameness between any of them. Each had aimed at picturesqueness or stately magnificence, and neither had failed to obtain it. Looking back as I now do upon Mizora, it presents itself to me as a vast and almost limitless landscape, variegated with grand cities, lovely towns and villages, majestic hills and mountains crowned with glittering snows, or deep delightful valleys veiled in scented vines. Kindness, cordiality and courtesy met us on every side. It was at first quite novel for me to mingle among previously unheard of people with such sociability, but I did as Warner did, and I found it not only convenient but quite agreeable. I am the daughter of the preceptress of the National College, said Wauna, and that was the way she introduced herself. I noticed with what honor and high esteem the name of the preceptress was regarded. As soon as it was known that the daughter of the preceptress had arrived, the citizens of whatever city we had stopped in hastened to extend to her every courtesy and favor possible for them to bestow. She was the daughter of a woman who held the highest and most enviable position in the nation a position that only great intellect could secure in that country. As we neared the goal of our journey, I noticed an increasing warmth of the atmosphere, and my ears were soon greeted with a deep, reverberating roar like continuous thunder. I have never seen and heard Niagara, but a thousand Niagaras could not equal that deafening sound. The heat became oppressive, the light also from a cause of which I shall soon speak. We ascended a promontory that jutted out from the mainland a quarter of a mile, perhaps more. Wauna conducted me to the edge of the cliff and told me to look down. An ocean of whirlpools was before us. The maddened dashing and thundering of the mighty waters, and the awe they inspired no words campaigned. Across such an abyss of terrors, it was certain no vessel could sail. We took our glasses and scanned the opposite shore which appeared to be a vast cataract as though the ocean was pouring over a precipice of rock. Wauna informed me that where the shore was visible, it was a perpendicular wall of smooth rock. Overhead, an arc of fire spanned the zenith from which depended curtains of rainbows waving and fluttering, folding and floating out again with a rapid and incessant motion. I asked Warner why they had not crossed in airships, and she said they had tried it often but had always failed. In former times, she said, when airships first came into use, it was frequently attempted, but no voyager ever returned. We have long since abandoned the attempt, for now we know it to be impossible. I looked again at that display of uncontrollable power. As I gazed, it seemed to me that I would be drawn down by the resistless fascination of terror. I grasped Warna and she gently turned my face to the smiling landscape behind us. Hills and valleys and sparkling cities veiled in foliage, with their numberless parks and fountains and statues sleeping in the soft light, gleaming lakes and wandering rivers that glittered and danced in the glorious atmosphere like prison sunbeams, greeted us like the alluring smile of love, and yet for the first time since entering this lovely land, I felt myself a prisoner. Behind me was an impassable barrier. Before me, far beyond this gleaming vision of enchantment, lay another road whose privations and dangers I dreaded to attempt. I felt as a bird might feel who has been brought from the free expanse of its wild forest home, and placed in a golden cage where it drinks from a jewel cup and eats daintier food than it could obtain in its own rude haunts. It pines for that precarious life. Its very dangers and privations fill its breasts with desire. I began to long with unutterable impatience to see once more the wild, rough scenes of my own nativity. Memory began to recall them with softening touches. My heart yearned for my own. The base as compared with Mizora though they be, there was the congeniality of blood between us. I longed to see my own little one whose dimpled hands I had unclasped from my neck in that agonized parting. Whenever I saw a Mizora mother fondling her babe, my heart leapt with quick desire to once more hold my own in such loving embrace. 
The mothers of Mizora have a devotional love for their children. Their smiles and prattle and baby wishes are listened to with loving tenderness and treated as matters of importance. I was sitting beside a Mizora mother one evening, listening to some singing that I truly thought no earthly melody could surpass. I asked the lady if ever she had heard anything sweeter, and she answered earnestly, Yes, the voices of my own children. On our homeward journey, Wauna took me to a lake from the center of which we could see, with our glasses, a green island rising high above the water like an emerald in a silver setting. That, said Wauna, directing my attention to it, is the last vestige of a prison left in Mizora. Would you like to visit it? I expressed an eager willingness to behold so curious a sight, and getting into a small pleasure boat, we started toward it. Boats are propelled in Mizora either by electricity or compressed air, and glide through the water with soundless swiftness. As we neared the island, I could perceive the mingling of natural and artificial attractions. We moored our boat at the foot of a flight of steps, hewn from the solid rock. On reaching the top, the scene spread out like a beautiful painting. Grottoes, fountains and cascades, winding walks and vine-covered bowers charmed us as we wandered about. In the center stood a medium-sized residence of white marble. We entered through a door opening on a white piazza. Art and wealth and taste had adorned the interior with a generous hand. A library studded with books closely shut behind glass doors had a wide window that commanded an enchanting view of the lake, with its rippling waters sparkling and dimpling in the light. On one side of the mantelpiece hung a full-length portrait of a lady, painted with startling naturalness. That, said Warner solemnly, was the last prisoner in Mizora. I looked with interested curiosity at a relic so curious in this land. It was a blonde woman, with lighter colored eyes than is at all common in Mizora. Her long blonde hair hung straight and unconfined over a dress of thick white material. Her attitude and expression were dejected and sorrowful. I had visited prisons in my own land where a red-handed murderer sat smiling with indifference. I had read in newspapers, labored eloquence that described the stoicism of some hardened criminal as a trait of character to be admired. I had read descriptions where mistaken eloquence exerted itself to waken sympathy for a criminal who had never felt sympathy for his helpless and innocent victims, and I had felt nothing but creeping horror for it all. But gazing at this picture of undeniable repentance, tears of sympathy started to my eyes. Had she been guilty of taking a fellow creature's life? Is she still living? I asked by way of a preface. Oh no, she has been dead for more than a century, answered Wauna. Was she confined here very long? For life, was the reply. I should not believe, I said, that a nature capable of so deep a repentance could be capable of so dark a crime as murder. Murder, exclaimed Wauna in horror. There has not been a murder committed in this land for three thousand years. It was my turn to be astonished. Then tell me what dreadful crime she committed. She struck her child, said Warner sadly. Her little innocent, helpless child that nature gave her to love and cherish and make noble and useful and happy. Did she inflict a permanent injury, I asked, with increased astonishment at this new phase of refinement in the Mizora character. No one can tell the amount of injury a blow does to a child. It may immediately show an obvious physical one. It may later develop a mental one. It may never seem to have injured it at all, and yet it may have shocked a sensitive nature and injured it permanently. Crime is evolved from perverted natures, and natures become perverted from ill usage. It merges into a peculiar structure of the brain that becomes hereditary. What became of the prisoner's child? It was adopted by a young lady who had just graduated at the state college of the state in which the mother resided. It was only five years old, and its mother's name was never mentioned to it or to anyone else. Long before that, the press had abolished the practice of giving any prominence to crime. That pernicious eloquence that in uncivilized ages had helped to nourish crime by a maudlin sympathy for the criminal had ceased to exist. The young lady called the child daughter, and it called her mother. Did the real mother never want to see her child? That is said to be a true picture of her, said Warner. 
and who can look at it and not see sorrow and remorse? How could you be so stern? I asked, in wondering astonishment. Pity has nothing to do with the crime, said Wana firmly. You must look to humanity, and not to the sympathy of one person excites when you are aiding enlightenment. That woman wandered about these beautiful grounds, or sat in this elegant home and lonely and unsympathized with prisoner. She was furnished with books, magazines and papers, and every physical comfort. Sympathy for her lot was never offered her. Childhood is regarded by my people as the only period of life that is capable of knowing perfect happiness, and among us it is a crime greater than the heinousness of murder in your country to deprive a human being of his childhood, in which cluster the only unalloyed sweets of life. A human being who remembers only pain, rebukes treatment in childhood, has lost the very flavor of existence, and the person who destroyed it is a criminal indeed. End of part two, chapter five. Part two, chapter six of Mizora, a prophecy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mizora, a prophecy, by Mary E. Bradley Lane. Part two, chapter six. There was one peculiarity about Mizora that I noticed soon after my arrival, but for various reasons have refrained from speaking of before now. It was the absence of houses devoted to religious worship. In architecture, Mizora displayed the highest perfection. Their colleges, art galleries, public libraries, opera houses, not all the public buildings were grand and beautiful. Never in any country had I beheld such splendor in design and execution. Their superior skill in this respect led me to believe that their temples of worship must be on a scale of magnificence beyond all my conceiving. I was eager to behold them. I looked often upon my first journeyings about their cities to discover them, but whenever I noticed an unusually imposing building and asked what it was, it was always something else. I was frequently on the point of asking them to conduct me to some church that resembled my own in worship, for I was brought up in strict compliance with the creeds, dogmas, and regulations of the Russo-Greek church, but I refrained hoping that in time I should be introduced to the religious ceremonies. When time passed on, and no invitation was extended me, and I saw no house nor preparation for religious worship, nor even heard mention of any, I asked Wauna for an explanation. She appeared not to comprehend me, and I asked the question, Where do you perform your religious rites and ceremonies? She looked at me with surprise. You ask me such strange questions that sometimes I am tempted to believe you a relic of ancient mythology that has drifted down the centuries and landed on our civilized shores, or else have been gifted with a marvelous prolongation of life, and have emerged upon us from some cavern where you have lived, or slept for ages in unchanged possession of your ancient superstition. Have you then, I asked in astonishment, no religious temples devoted to worship? Oh, yes, we have temples where we worship daily. Do you see that building? Nodding toward the majestic granite walls of the National College. That is one of our most renowned temples, where the highest and the noblest in the land meet and mingle familiarly with the humblest in daily worship. I understand all that you wish to imply by that, I replied. But have you no building devoted to divine worship? No temple that belongs specially to your deity, to the being that created you, and to whom you owe eternal gratitude and homage. We have, she answered grandly, with a majestic wave of her hand, and in that mellow, musical voice that was sweeter than the chanting of birds, she exclaimed, This vast cathedral, boundless as our wonder, whose shining lamps yon brilliant mists supply, its choir the winds and waves, its organ thunder, its dome the sky. Do you worship nature? I asked. If we did, we should worship ourselves, for we are part of nature. But do you not recognize an invisible and incomprehensible being that created you, and who will give your spirit an abode of eternal bliss, or consign it to eternal torments, according as you have glorified and served him? I am an atom of nature, said Wona gravely. 
If you want me to answer your superstitious notions of religion, I will, in one sentence, explain that the only religious idea in Mizora is, nature is God, and God is nature. She is the great mother who gathers the centuries in her arms, and rocks their children into eternal sleep upon her bosom. But how? I asked in bewildered astonishment. How can you think of living without creeds and confessionals? How can you prosper without prayer? How can you be upright and honest and true to yourself and your friends without praying for divine grace and strength to sustain you? How can you be noble and keep from envying your neighbors without a prayer for divine grace to assist you to resist such temptation? Oh, daughter of the dark ages, said Wauna sadly. Turn to the benevolent and ever-willing science. She is the goddess who has led us out of ignorance and superstition, out of degradation and disease, and every other wretchedness that superstitious, degraded humanity has known. She has lifted us above the low and the little, the narrow and the mean in human thought and action, and has placed us in a broad, free, independent, noble, useful, and grandly happy life. You have been favored by divine grace, I reiterated, although you refuse to acknowledge it. She smiled compassionately as she answered. She is the divinity who never turned a deaf ear to earnest and persistent effort in a sensible direction. But prayers to her must be work, resolute and conscientious work. She teaches that success in this world can only come to those who work for it. In your superstitious belief, you pray for benefits you have never earned, possibly do not deserve, but expect to get simply because you pray for them. Science never betrays such partiality. The favor she bestows are comfort only upon the industrious. And you deny absolutely the efficacy of prayer? I asked. If I could obtain anything by prayer alone, I would pray that my inventive faculty should be enlarged so that I might conceive and construct an airship that could cleave its way through the chaos of winds that is formed when two storms meet from opposite directions. It would rend to atoms one of our present make. But prayer will never produce an improved airship. We must dig into science for it. Our ancestors did not pray for us to become a race of symmetrically shaped and universally healthy people and expect that to affect a result. They went to work on scientific principles to root out disease and crime and want and wretchedness and every degrading and retarding influence. Prayer never saved one of my ancestors from premature death, she continued, with a resolution that seemed determined to tear from my mind every fabric of faith in the consolations of divine interposition that had been a special part of my education and had become rooted in my nature. The seas, when it fastened upon the vitals of the young and beautiful and dearly loved, was stronger and more powerful than all the agonized prayers that could be poured from breaking hearts. But science, when solicited by careful study and experiment and investigation, offered the remedy. And now we defy the seas and have no fear of death until our natural time comes, and then it will be the welcome rest that the worn-out body meets with gratitude. But when you die... I exclaimed, do you not believe you have an afterlife? When I die, replied Wauna, my body will return to the elements from whence it came. Thought will return to the force which gave it. The power of the brain is the one mystery that surrounds life. We know that the brain is a mechanical structure and acted upon by force, but how to analyze that force is still beyond our reach. You see that huge engine? We made it. It is a fine piece of mechanism. We know what it was made to do. We turn on the motive power, and it moves at the rate of a mile a minute if we desired. Why should it move? Why might it not stand still? You say because of a law of nature that under the circumstances compels it to move. Our brain is like that engine, a wonderful piece of mechanism, and when the blood drives it, it displays the effects of force which we call thought. We can see the engine move, and we know what law of nature it obeys in moving, but the brain is a more mysterious structure, for the force which compels it to action we cannot analyze. The superstitious ancients called this mystery the soul. And do you discard that belief? 
I asked, trembling and excited to hear such sacrilegious talk from youth so beautiful and pure. What our future is to be after dissolution no one knows, replied Wauna, with the greatest calmness and unconcern. A thousand theories and systems of religion have risen and fallen in the history of human family and become the superstitions of the past. The elements that compose this body may construct the delicate beauty of a flower, or the green robe that covers the bosom of Mother Earth, but we cannot know. But that beautiful belief in a soul, I cried in real anguish, how can you discard it? How severe the hope that after death we are again united to part no more? Those who have left us in the springtime of life, the bloom on their young cheeks suddenly paled by the cold touch of death, stand waiting to welcome us to an endless reunion. Alas, for your anguish, my friend, said Wona with pitying tenderness. Centuries ago my people passed through that season of mental pain. That beautiful visionary idea of a soul must fade, as youth and beauty fade, never to return. For nature nowhere teaches the existence of such a thing. It was a belief born of that agony of longing for happiness without alloy, which the children of earth in the long ago ages hoped for but never knew. Their lot was so barren of beauty and happiness, and the desire for it is now and always has been a strong trait of human character. The conditions of society in those earlier ages rendered it impossible to enjoy this life perfectly, and hope and longing pictured an imaginary one for an imaginary part of the body called the soul. Progress and civilization have brought us to the ideal heaven of the ancients, and we receive from nature no evidence of any other. But I do believe there is another, I declared, and we ought to be prepared for it. Wauna smiled. What better preparation could you desire then than good works in this, she asked. You should pray and do penance for your sins, was my reply. Then, said Wauna, we are doing the wisest penance every day. We are studying, investigating, experimenting in order that those who come after us may be happier than we. Every day science is yielding us some new knowledge that will make living in the future still easier than now. I cannot conceive, I said, how you are to be improved upon. When we manufacture fruit and vegetables from the elements, can you not perceive how much is to be gained? Old age and death will come later, and the labor of cultivation will be done away. Such an advantage will not be enjoyed during my lifetime, but we will labor to effect it for future generations. Your whole aim in life, then, is to work for the future of your race instead of the eternal welfare of your own soul? I questioned in surprise. If nature, said Wauna, has provided us a future life, if that mysterious something that we call thought is to be clothed in an etherealized body and live in a world where decay is unknown, I have no fear of my reception there. Live this life usefully and nobly, and no matter if a prayer has never crossed your lips, your happiness will be assured. A just and kind action will help you farther on the road to heaven than all the prayers that you can utter and all the pains and sufferings that you can inflict upon the flesh, for it will be that much added to the happiness of this world. The grandest epitaph that could be written is engraved upon a tombstone in yonder cemetery. The subject was one of the pioneers of progress in a long-ago century, when progress fought its way with difficulty through ignorance and superstition. She suffered through life for the boldness of her opinions, and two centuries later, when they had become popular, a monument was erected to her memory, and has been preserved through thousands of years as a motto for humanity. The epitaph is simply this. The world is better for her having lived in it. End of part two, chapter six. Part two, chapter seven of Mizora, a prophecy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mizora, a Prophecy by Mary E. Bradley Lane Part 2, Chapter 7 Not long after my conversation with Wauna, mentioned in the previous chapter, 
an event happened in Mizora of so singular and unexpected a character for that country that it requires a particular description. I refer to the death of a young girl, the daughter of the professor of natural history in the National College, whose impressive inaugural ceremonies I had witnessed with so much gratification. The girl was of a venturesome disposition, and with a number of others, had gone out rowing. The boats they used in Mizora for that purpose were mere cockle shells. A sudden squall arose from which all could have escaped, but the reckless daring of this young girl cost her her life. Her boat was capsized, and despite the exertions made by her companions, she was drowned. Her body was recovered before the news was conveyed to the mother. As the young companion surrounded it in the abandon of grief that tender and artless youth alone feels, had I not known that not a tie of consanguinity existed between them, I might have thought them a band of sisters mourning their broken number. It was a scene I never expect and sincerely hope never to witness again. It made a deeper impression upon me because I knew the expressions of grief were all genuine. I asked Wauna if any of the dead girl's companions feared that her mother might censure them for not making sufficient effort to save her when her boat capsized. She looked at me with astonishment. Such a thought, she said, will never occur to her nor to anyone else in Mizora. I have not asked the particulars, but I know that everything was done that could have been done to save her. There must have been something extraordinarily unusual about the affair, for all Mizora girls are expert swimmers, and there is not one but would put forth any exertion to save a companion. I afterward learned that such had really been the case. It developed upon the preceptress to break the news to the afflicted mother. It was done in the seclusion of her own home. There was no manifestation of morbid curiosity among acquaintances, neighbors, and friends. The preceptress and one or two others of her nearest and most intimate friends called at the house during the first shock of her bereavement. After permission had been given to view the remains, Wauna and I called at the house, but only entered the drawing room. On a low cot, in an attitude of peaceful repose, lay the breathless sleeper. Her mother and sisters had performed for her the last sad offices of loving duty, and lovely indeed had they made the last view we should have of their dear one. There was to be no ceremony at the house, and Wauna and I were in the cemetery when the procession entered. As we passed through the city, I noticed that every business house was closed. The whole city was sympathizing with sorrow. I never before saw so vast a concourse of people. The procession was very long and headed by the mother, dressed and veiled in black. Behind her were the sisters carrying the body. It rested upon a litter composed entirely of white rosebuds. The sisters wore white, their faces concealed by white veils. Each wore a white rosebud pinned upon her bosom. They were followed by a long procession of young girls, schoolmates and friends of the dead. They were all dressed in white, but were not veiled. Each one carried a white rosebud. The sisters placed the litter upon rests at the side of the grave, and clasping hands with their mother, formed a semicircle about it. They were all so closely veiled that their features could not be seen, and no emotion was visible. The procession of young girls formed a circle enclosing the grave and the mourners, and began chanting a slow and sorrowful dirge. No words can paint the pathos and beauty of such a scene. My eye took in every detail that displayed that taste for the beautiful that compels the Mizora mind to mingle it with every incident of life. The melody sounded like a chorus of birds chanting, in perfect unison, a weird requiem over some dead companion. She came like the spring in its gladness. We received her with joy. We rejoiced in her promise. Sweet was her song as the birds. Her smile was as due to the thirsty rose. But the end came, ere morning awakened, while dawn yet blushed its bridal veil. The leafy music of the woods was hushed in snowy shrouds. Spring withered with the perfume in her hands. A winter sleet has fallen upon the buds of June. The ice winds blow where yesterday Cepheus disported. Life is not consummated. The rose has not blossomed, the fruit has perished in the flower. The bird lies frozen under its mother's breast. 
Youth sleeps in round loveliness when age should lie withered and weary and full of honor. Then the grave would be welcome, and our tears would fall not. The grave is not for the roses of youth. We mourn the early departed. Youth sleeps without dreams, without an awakening. At the close of the chant, the mother first and then each sister took from her bosom the white rosebud and dropped it into the grave. Then followed her schoolmates and companions, who each dropped in the bud she carried. A carpet of white rosebuds was thus formed, on which the body, still reclining upon its pillow of flowers, was gently lowered. The body was dressed in white, and over all fell a veil of fine white tulle. A more beautiful sight I can never see than that young, lovely girl in her last leap with the emblems of youth, purity and swift decay forming her pillow and winding sheet. Over this was placed a film of glass that rested upon the bottom and sides of the thin lining that covered the bottom and lower sides of the grave. The remainder of the procession of young girls then came forward and dropped their rosebuds upon it, completely hiding from view the young and beautiful dead. The eldest sister then took a handful of dust and casting it into the grave, said in a voice broken, yet audible, Mingle ashes with ashes, and dust with its original dust. To the earth whence it was taken, consign we the body of our sister. Each sister then threw in a handful of dust, and then with their mother entered their carriage, which immediately drove them home. A beautiful silver spade was sticking in the soft earth that had been taken from the grave. The most intimate of the dead girl's friends took a spade full of earth and threw it into the open grave. Her example was followed by each one of the remaining companions until the grave was filled. Then, clasping hands, they chanted a farewell to their departed companion and playmate, after which they strewed the grave with flowers until it looked like a bed of beauty and departed. I was profoundly impressed by the scene, its solemnity, its beauty, and the universal expression of sorrow it had called forth. A whole city mourned the premature death of gifted and lovely youth. Alas, in my own unhappy country such an event would have elicited but a passing phrase of regret from all except the immediate family of the victim. For there, sorrow is a guest to every heart, and leaves little room for sympathy with strangers. The next day, the mother was at her post in the National College. The daughters were at their studies, all seemingly calm and thoughtful, but showing no outward signs of grief excepting to the close observer. The mother was performing her accustomed duties with seeming cheerfulness, but now and then her mind would drop for a moment in sorrowful abstraction, to be recalled with resolute effort and be fastened once more upon the necessary duty of life. The sisters I often saw in those abstracted moods, and frequently saw them wiping away silent but unobtrusive tears. I asked Warner for the meaning of such stoical reserve, and the explanation was as curious as were all the other things that I met with in Mizora. If you notice the custom of different grades of civilization in your own country, said Warner, you will observe that the lower the civilization, the louder and more ostentatious is the mourning. True refinement is unobtrusive in everything, and while we do not desire to repress a natural and inevitable feeling of sorrow, we do desire to conceal and conquer it, for the reason that death is a law of nature that we cannot evade. And although the death of a young person has not occurred in Mizora in the memory of any living before this, yet it is not without precedent. We are very prudent, but we cannot guard entirely against accident. It has cast a gloom over the whole city yet we refrain from speaking of it, and strive to forget it because it cannot be helped. And can you see so young, so fair a creature perish without wanting to meet her again? Whatever sorrow we feel, replied Warner solemnly, we deeply realize how useless it is to repine. We place implicit faith in the revelations of nature, and in no circumstances does she bid us suspect a life beyond that of the body. That is a life of individual consciousness. How much more consoling is the belief of my people, I replied triumphantly. Their belief in a future reunion would sustain them through the sorrow of parting in this. It has been claimed that some have lived pure lives solely in the hope of meeting someone whom they loved, and who had died in youth and innocence. Wauna smiled. 
"'You do not all have, then, the same fate in anticipation for your future life?' she asked. "'Oh, no,' I answered. "'The good and the wicked are divided.' Tell me some incident in your own land that you have witnessed, and which illustrates the religious belief of your country. The belief that we have in a future life has often furnished a theme for the poets of my own and other countries, and sometimes a quaint and pretty sentiment is introduced into poetry to express it. I should like to hear some such poetry. Can you recite any? I remember an incident that gave birth to a poem that was much admired at the time, although I can recall but the two last stanzas of it. A rowing party, of which I was a member, once went out upon a lake to view the sunset. After we had returned to shore, and night had fallen upon the water in impenetrable darkness, it was discovered that one of the young men who had rowed out in a boat by himself was not with us. A storm was approaching, and we all knew that his safety lay in getting ashore before it broke. We lighted a fire, but the blaze could not be seen far in such inky darkness. We hallooed but received no answer, and finally ceased our efforts. Then one of the young ladies, who possessed a very high and clear soprano voice, began singing at the very top of her power. It reached the wanderer in the darkness, and he rolled straight toward it. From that time on he became infatuated with the singer, declaring that her voice had come to him in his despair, like an angel's straight from heaven. She died in less than a year, and her last words to him were, Meet me in heaven. He had always been recklessly inclined, but after that he became a model of rectitude and goodness. He wrote a poem that was dedicated to her memory. In it he describes himself as a lone wanderer on a strange sea in the darkness of a gathering storm and no beacon to guide him, when suddenly he hears a voice singing which guides him safe to shore. He speaks of the beauty of the singer and how dear she became to him, but he still hears the song calling him across the ocean of death. Repeat what you remember of it, urged Warner. The face and form have long since gone, beyond where the day was lifted. But the beckoning song still lingers on, and angels earthward drifted. And when death's waters around me roar, and cares like the birds are winging, if I steer my bark to heaven's shore, twill be by an angel singing. Poor child of superstition, said Warner sadly. Your belief has something pretty in it, but for your own welfare and that of your people, you must get rid of it as we have got rid of the offspring of lust. Our children come to us as welcome guests through portals of the holiest and purest affection. That love which you speak of, I know nothing about. I would not know. It is a degradation which mars your young life and embitters the memories of age. We have advanced beyond it. There is a cruelty in life she added compassionately, which we must accept with stoicism as the inevitable. Justice to your posterity demands of you the highest and noblest efforts of which your intellect is capable. End of part two, chapter seven. Part two, chapter eight of Mizora, a prophecy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Burke. Mizora, A Prophecy by Mary E. Bradley Lane. Part 2, Chapter 8. The conversation that I had with Juana gave me so much uneasiness that I sought her mother. I cannot express the shock I felt at hearing such youthful and innocent lips speak of the absurdity of religious forms, ceremonies, and creeds. She regarded my belief in them as a species of barbarism, but she had not convinced me. I was resolved not to be convinced. I believed she was in error. Surely, I thought, a country so far advanced in civilization and practicing such unexampled rectitude must, according to my religious teaching, have been primarily actuated by religious principles which they had since abandoned. My only surprise was that they had not relapsed into immorality after destroying church and creed and I began to feel anxious to convince them of the danger I felt they were incurring in neglecting prayer and supplication at the throne to continue them in their progress toward perfection of mental and moral culture. I explained my feelings to the preceptress with great earnestness and anxiety for their future, intimating that I believed their immunity from disaster had been owing to divine sufferance. For no nation, I added, quoting from my memory of religious precepts, 
can prosper without acknowledging the Christian religion. She listened to me with great attention, and when I finished, asked, How do you account for our long continuance in prosperity and progress? For it is more than a thousand years since we rooted out the last vestige of what you term religion from the mind. We have had a long immunity from punishment. To what do you attribute it? I hesitated to explain what had been in my mind, but finally faltered out something about the absence of the male sex. I then had to explain that the prisons and penitentiaries of my own land, and of all other civilized lands that I knew of, were almost exclusively occupied by the male sex. Out of eight hundred penitentiary prisoners, not more than twenty or thirty would be women, and the majority of them could trace their crimes to man's infidelity. And what do you do to reform them? inquired the preceptress. We offer them the teachings of Christianity. All countries, however, differ widely in this respect. The government of my country is not as generous to prisoners as that of some others. In the United States, every penitentiary is supplied with a minister who expounds the gospel to the prisoners every Sunday, that is, once every seven days. And what do they do the rest of the time? They work. Are they ignorant? Oh, yes, indeed, I replied earnestly. You could not find one scholar in ten thousand of them. Their education is either very limited or altogether deficient. Do the buildings they are confined in cost a great deal? Vast sums of money are represented by them, and it often costs a community a great deal of money to send a criminal to the penitentiary. In some states, the power to pardon rests entirely with the governor, and it frequently occurs that a desperate criminal, who has cost a county a great deal of money to get rid of him, will be pardoned by the governor to please a relative, or, as it is sometimes believed, for a bribe. And do the people never think of educating their criminals instead of working them? That would be an expense to the government, I replied. If they would divide the time, and compel them to study half a day as rigorously as they make them work, it would soon make a vast change in their morals. Nothing so ennobles the mind as a broad and thorough education. They are compelled to listen to religious instruction once a week, I answered. That surely ought to make some improvement in them. I remember hearing an American lady relate her attendance at chapel service in a state penitentiary one Sunday. The minister's education was quite limited, as she could perceive from the ungrammatical language he used. But he preached sound orthodox doctrine. The text selected had a special application to his audience. Depart from me, ye accursed, into everlasting torment prepared for the devil and his angels. There were eight hundred prisoners, and the minister assured them in plain language that such would surely be their sentence unless they repented. And that is what you call the consolations of religion, is it? asked the preceptress, with an expression that rather disconcerted me, as though my zeal and earnestness entirely lacked the light of knowledge with which she viewed it. That is religious instruction, I answered. The minister exhorted the prisoners to pray and be purged of their sins, and it was good advice. But they might aver, persisted the preceptress, that they had prayed to be restrained from crime, and their prayers had not been answered. They didn't pray with enough faith, then, I assured her, in the confidence of my own belief. That is wherein I think my own church is so superior to the other religions of the world, I added proudly. We can get the priest to absolve us from sin, and then we know we are rid of it, when he tells us so. But what assurance have you that the priest can do so? asked the preceptress. Because it is his duty to do so. Education will root out more sin than all your creeds can, gravely answered the preceptress. Educate your convicts and train them into controlling and subduing their criminal tendencies by their own will, and it will have more effect on their morals than all the prayers ever uttered. Educate them up to that point where they can perceive for themselves the happiness of moral lives, and then you may trust them to temptation without fear. The ideas you have expressed about dogmas, creeds, and ceremonies are not new to us, though, as a nation, we do not make a study of them. They are very, very ancient. They go back to the first records of the traditionary history of man. And the farther you go back, the deeper you plunge into ignorance and superstition. The more ignorant the human mind, 
the more abject was its slavery to religion. As history progresses toward a more diffuse education of the masses, the forms, ceremonies, and beliefs in religion are continually changing to suit the advancement of intelligence. And, when intelligence becomes universal, they will be renounced altogether. What is true of the history of one people will be true of the history of another. Religions are not necessary to human progress. They are really clogs. My ancestors had more trouble to extirpate these superstitious ideas from the mind than they had in getting rid of disease and crime. There were several reasons for this difficulty. Disease and crime were self-evident evils that the narrowest intelligence could perceive, but beliefs in creeds and superstitions were perversions of judgment resulting from a lack of thorough mental training. As soon, however, as education of a high order became universal, it began to disappear. No mind of philosophical culture can adhere to such superstitions. Many ages the people made idols, and, decking them with rich ornaments, placed them in magnificent temples specially built for them, and the rites by which they worshipped them. There have existed many variations of this kind of idolatry that are marked by the progressive stages of civilization. Some nations of remote antiquity were highly cultured in art and literature, yet worshipped gods of their own manufacture or imaginary gods for everything. Light and darkness, the seasons, earth, air, water, all had a separate deity to preside over and control their special services. They offered sacrifices to these deities as they desired their cooperation or favor in some enterprise to be undertaken. In remote antiquity, we read of a great general about to set out upon the sea to attack an army of another nation. In order to propitiate the god of the ocean, he had a fine chariot built to which were harnessed two beautiful white horses. In the presence of a vast concourse of people collected to witness the ceremony, he drove them into the sea. When they sank out of sight, it was supposed that the god had accepted the present, and would show his gratitude for it by favoring winds and peaceful weather. A thousand years afterward, history speaks of the occurrence derisively, as an absurd superstition, and, at the same time, they believed in and lauded a more absurd and cruel religion. They worshipped an imaginary being who had created and possessed absolute control of everything. Some of the human family it had pleased him to make eminently good, while others he made eminently bad. For those whom he had created with evil desires, he prepared a lake of molten fire into which they were to be cast after death, to suffer endless torture for doing what they had been expressly created to do. Those who had been created good were to be rewarded for following out their natural inclinations by occupying a place near the deity, where they were to spend eternity in singing praises to him. He could, however, be persuaded by prayer from following his original intentions. Very earnest prayer had caused him to change his mind and send rain when he had previously concluded to visit the country with drought. Two nations at war with each other, in believing in the same deity, would pray for a pestilence to visit their enemy. Death was universally regarded as a visitation of providence for some offense committed against him instead of against the laws of nature. Some believed that prayer and donations to the church or priest could induce the deity to take their relatives from the lake of torment and place them in his own presence. The deity was prayed to on every occasion, and for every trivial object. The poor and indolent prayed for him to send them food and clothes. The sick prayed for health, the foolish for wisdom, and the revengeful besought the deity to consign all their enemies to the burning lake. The intelligent and humane began to doubt the necessity of such dreadful and needless torment for every conceivable misdemeanor, and it was modified and eventually dropped altogether. Education finally rooted out every phase of superstition from the minds of the people, and now we look back and smile at the massive and magnificent structures erected to the worship of a deity who could be coaxed to change his mind by prayer. I did not tell the preceptress that she had been giving me a history of my own ancestry, but I remarked the resemblance with the joyous hope that in the future of my own unhappy country lay the possibility of a civilization so glorious, the ideal heaven of which every sorrowing heart had dreamed but always with the desire to believe it had a spiritual eternity. End of Part 2, Chapter 8 
Part 2, Chapter 9 of Mizora, A Prophecy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Burke. Mizora, A Prophecy by Mary E. Bradley Lane. Part 2, Chapter 9 i have described the peculiar ceremony attending the burial of youth in mizora old age in some respects had a similar ceremony but the funeral of an aged person differed greatly from what i had witnessed at the grave of youth wana and i had attended the funeral of a very aged lady death in mizora was the gradual failing of mental and physical vigor it came slowly and unaccompanied with pain it was received without regret and witnessed without tears. The daughters performed the last labor that the mother required. They arrayed her body for burial and bore it to the grave. If in that season of the year autumn leaves hid the bier and formed the covering and pillow of her narrow bed, if not in the fall, full-blown roses and matured flowers were substituted. The ceremony was conducted by the eldest daughter, assisted by the others. No tears were shed, no mourning worn, no sorrowful chanting. A solemn dirge was sung indicative of decay. A dignified solemnity befitting the farewell to a useful life was manifest in all the proceedings, but no demonstrations of sorrow were visible. The mourners were unveiled and performed the last services for their mother with calmness. I was so astonished at the absence of mourning that I asked an explanation of Juana. Why should we mourn? was the surprising answer, for what is inevitable? Death must come, and in this instance it came in its natural way. There is nothing to be regretted or mourned over, as there was in the drowning of my young friend. Her life was suddenly arrested while yet in the promise of its fruitfulness. There was cause for grief, and the expressions and emblems of mourning were proper and appropriate. But here, mourning would be out of place, for life has fulfilled its promises. Its work is done, and nature has given the worn-out body rest. That is all. That sympathy and regret which the city had expressed for the young dead was manifested only in decorum and respectful attendance at the funeral. No one appeared to feel that it was an occasion for mourning. How strange it all seemed to me, and yet there was a philosophy about it that I could not help but admire. Only I wished that they believed as I did that all of those tender associations would be resumed beyond the grave. If only they could be convinced. I again broached the subject to Juana. I could not relinquish the hope of converting her to my belief. She was so beautiful, so pure, and I loved her so dearly. I could not give up my hope of an eternal reunion. I appealed to her sympathy. What hope, I asked, can you offer those whose lives have been only successive phases of unhappiness? Why should beings be created only to live a life of suffering, and then die, as many, very many of my people do? If they had no hope of a spiritual life, where pain and sorrow are to be unknown, the burdens of this life could not be borne. You have the same consolation, replied Juana, as the preceptress had in losing her daughter. That daring spirit that cost her her life was the pride of her mother. She possessed a promising intellect, Yet her mother accepts her death as one of the sorrowful phases of life, and bravely tries to subdue its pain. Long ages behind us, as my mother has told you, the history of all human life was but a succession of woes. Our own happy state has been evolved by slow degrees out of that sorrowful past. Human progress is marked by blood and tears, and the heart's bitterest anguish. We as a people have progressed almost beyond the reach of sorrow, but you are in the midst of it. You must work for the future, though you cannot be of it. I cannot, I declared, reconcile myself to your belief. I am separated from my child. To think I am never to see it in this world, nor through endless ages, would drive me insane with despair. What consolation can your belief offer me? In this life, you may yearn for your child. But after this life you sleep, answered Juana sententiously. And how sweet that sleep! No dreams, no waking to work and trial, no striving after perfection, 
no planning for the morrow. It is oblivion than which there can be no happier heaven. Would not meeting with those you loved be happier? I asked in amazement. There would be happiness, and there would be work too. But my religion does not believe in work in heaven, I answered. Then it has not taken the immutable laws of nature into consideration, said Juana. If nature has prepared a conscious existence for us after this body decays, she has prepared work for us, you may rest assured. It might be a grander, nobler work, but it would be work nevertheless. Then, how restful in contrast is our religion. It is eternal, undisturbable rest for both body and brain. Besides, as you say yourself, you cannot be sure of meeting those whom you desire to meet in that other country. They may be the ones condemned to eternal suffering for their sins. Think you I could enjoy myself in any surroundings when I knew that those who were dear to me in this life were enduring torment that could have no end? Give me oblivion rather than such a heaven. Our punishment comes in this world, but it is not so much through sin as ignorance. The savages lived lives of misery occasioned by their lack of intelligence. Humanity must always suffer for the mistakes it makes. Misery belongs to the ignorant, happiness to the wise. That is our doctrine of reward and punishment. And you believe that my people will one day reject all religions? When they are advanced enough, she answered, you say you have scholars among you already who preach their inconsistencies. What do you call them? Philosophers, was my reply. They are your prophets, said Juana. When they break the shackles that bind you to creeds and dogmas, they will have done much to advance you. To rely on one's own willpower to do right is the only safe road to morality, and your only heaven. I left Juana and sought a secluded spot by the river. I was shocked beyond measure at her confession. It had the earnestness, and to me, the cruelty of conviction. To live without a spiritual future in anticipation was akin to depravity, to crime and its penalty of prison life forever. Yet here was a people, noble, exalted beyond my conceiving, living in the present and obeying only a duty to posterity. I recalled a painting I had once seen that always possessed for me a horrible fascination. In a cave, with his foot upon the corpse of a youth, sat the crowned and sceptered majesty of death. The waters of oblivion encompassed the throne and corpse, which lay with its head and feet bathed in its waters. For out of the unknown had life come, and to the unknown had it departed. Before me, in vision, swept the mighty stream of human life from which I had been swept to these strange shores. All its suffering, its delusions, its baffled struggles, its wrongs, came upon me with a sense of spiritual agony in them that religion, my religion, which was their only consolation, must vanish in the crucible of science, and that science was the magician that was to purify and exalt the world, to live in the present, to die in it and become as the dust, a mere speck, a flash of activity in the far, limitless expanse of nature, of force, of matter, in which a spiritual ideal had no part. It was horrible to think of. The prejudices of inherited religious faith, the contracted forces of thought in which I had been born and reared, could not be uprooted or expanded without pain. End of Part 2 Chapter 9Part 2, Chapter 10 of Misera, A Prophecy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Misera, A Prophecy by Mary E. Bradley Lane. Part 2, Chapter 10. I had begun to feel an intense longing to return to my own country but it was accompanied by a desire equally as strong to carry back to that woe-burdened land some of the noble lessons and doctrines i had learned in this i saw no means of doing it that seemed so available as a companion a being born and bred in an atmosphere of honour and grandly humane ideas and actions my heart and my judgment turned to warner she was endeared to me by long and gentle association 
she was self-reliant and courageous and possessed a strong will who of all my misera acquaintances was so well adapted to the service i required when i broached the subject to her wona expressed herself as really pleased with the idea but when we went to the preceptress she acknowledged a strong reluctance to the proposition she said wona can form no conception of the conditions of society in your country they are far very far behind our own they will i fear chafe her own nature more than she can improve theirs still if i thought she could lead your people into a broader intelligence and start them on the way upward to enlightenment and real happiness i would let her go the moment however that she desires to return she must be aided to do so i pledged myself to abide by any request the preceptress might make of me wona's own inclinations greatly influenced her mother and finally we obtained her consent our preparations were carefully made the advanced knowledge of chemistry in mizora placed many advantages in our way our boat was an ingenious contrivance with a thin glass top that could be removed and folded away until needed to protect us from the rigors of the arctic climate i had given an accurate description of the rapids that would oppose us and our boat was furnished with a motive power sufficient to drive us through them at a higher rate of speed than what they moved at it was built so as to be easily converted into a sled and runners were made that could be readily adjusted we were provided with food and clothing prepared expressively for the severe change to and rigors of the arctic climate through which we must pass i was constantly dreading the terrors of that long ice-bound journey but the preceptress appeared to be little concerned about it when i spoke of its severities she said for us to observe her directions and we should not suffer she asked me if i had ever felt uncomfortable in any of the airship voyages i had taken and said that the cold of the upper regions through which i had passed in their country was quite as intense as any i could meet within a lower atmosphere of my own the newspapers had a great deal to say about the departure of the preceptor's daughter on so uncertain a mission and to that strange land of barbarians which i represented when the day arrived for our departure immense throngs of people from all parts of the country lined the shore or looked down upon us from their anchored airships the last words of farewell had been spoken to my many friends and benefactors warner had bidden a multitude of associates good-bye and clasped her mother's hand which she held until the boat parted from the shore years have passed since that memorable parting but the look of yearning love in that mizora mother's eyes haunts me still long and vainly has she watched for a boat's prow to cleave that amber mist and bear to her arms that vision of beauty and tender love i took away from her my heart saddens at the thought of her grief and long long waiting that only death will end we pointed the boat's prow toward the wide mysterious circle of amber mists and then turned our eyes for a last look at mizora rona stood silent and calm earnestly gazing into the eyes of her mother until the shore and the multitude of fair faces faded like a vision of heaven from our views o oh, beautiful mizora cried the voice of my heart shall i ever again see a land so fair where nature so noble and aims so lofty have their abiding place memory will return to you though my feet may never again tread your delightful shores farewell sweet ideal land of my soul of humanity farewell my thoughts turned to that other world from which i had journeyed so long would the time ever come when it too would be a land of universal intelligence and happiness when the difference of nations would be settled by argument instead of battle when disease deformity and premature death would be unknown when locks and bolts and bars would be useless i hoped so much from the personal influence of wona so noble so utterly unconscious of wrong she must surely revolutionize human nature whenever it came in contact with her own i pictured to myself my own dear land dear despite its many phases of wretchedness smiling in universal comfort and health i imagined its political prisons yawning with emptiness while their haggard and decrepit and sorrowful occupants hobbled out into the sunshine of liberty and the new life we were bringing to them 
fancy flew abroad on the wings of hope dropping the seeds of progress wherever it passed the poor should be given work and justly paid for it instead of being supported by charity the charity that had fostered indolence in its mistaken efforts to do good should be employed to train poverty to skilful labour and economy in living and what a world of good that one measure would produce the poor should possess exactly the same educational advantages that were supplied to the rich in this one measure if i could only make it popular i would see the golden promise of the future of my country educate your poor and they will work out their own salvation educated labour can dictate its rights to capital how easy of accomplishment it all seemed to me who had seen the practical benefits arising to a commonwealth that had adopted these mottoes i doubted not that the wiser and better of my own people would aid and encourage me free education would lead to other results riches should be accumulated only by vast and generous industries that reach the helping hand to thousands of industrious poor instead of grinding them out of a few hundred of poorly paid and overworked artisans education in the hands of the poor would be a powerful agent with which they would alleviate their own condition and defend themselves against oppression and knavery the prisons should be supplied with schools as well as workrooms where the intellect should be trained and cultivated and where moral idiocy by the stern and rigorous law of justice to innocence should be forced to deny itself posterity no philanthropical mind ever spread the wings of its fancy for a broader flight end of part two chapter ten